GCC, we are here to talk through Chapter 6, The Periodic Table. Uh, this is for Chem 130. The periodic table was first arranged uh, by Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian. Uh, he put elements with similar properties in the same columns and it looked kind of like this. Um, it didn't last very long because the groups weren't really um, in order of how they reacted similarly. Uh, but this was the first periodic table and the Russian does get credit for being the first person to try to put the elements in a table. Mosley rearranged the elements later in increasing atomic number, so 1 through uh, 100, those numbers, the atomic number, and we came upon the periodic law, and that's elements in the same column have similar properties. So a column again goes up and down, and elements in the same column uh, behave similarly chemically. Finally, it was Niels Bohr idea of electrons being quantized that led to the S sublevels, P sublevels, D sublevels, and F sublevel organization of the chart. The modern chart now has the S in the first two columns, the P in the six columns on the far side, the D transition metals are in the middle, and then the bottom part is the F. So the modern periodic tables to this day still is arranged in blocks of S, P, D, and F. So a horizontal row is called a period. So that is going left to right. A vertical column is called a group. Columns go up and down. Elements in the same group, meaning in the same column, exhibit similar properties chemically. The main group elements are the ones that have the Roman numerals with the A. We call them A groups. And then the transition metals are in the B group. So here's just a periodic table showing you periods. We have the period from lithium number 3 across to neon number 10 uh, highlighted. So that's period 2. Always remember that hydrogen and helium are considered to be period 1. So hydrogen and helium, that's row 1, that's period 1. And then lithium across to neon is period 2. We also have highlighted number 37 rubidium across to xenon 54. That is period 5 because you count down from hydrogen 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to rubidium. So the row or period across would be period 5. Group again is vertical up and down. So we have highlighted group 1A for you. So that is group 1A. If you'll remember the name for that group, except for hydrogen, is the alkaline earth, sorry, alkali metals, alkali metals, group 1A. Uh, and then we also have highlighted the oxygen column. So that is group 6A. Again, groups go up and down. So elements in the same group exhibit similar properties. Just to review, I'll remind you column 1A is alkali metals, column 2A is the alkaline earth metals, then the very last column, column 8A, is the noble gases, and then next to it, column 7A, that is our halogens. In fact, there we are right there. Group 1A is our alkali metals, group 2A is our alkaline earth metals, group 7A is halogens, and group 8A is the noble gases. Now hydrogen is considered to be its own group. So we want to have those group names memorized and hydrogen does not belong in group 1A. It's considered to be its own group. It is unique. Now here we have highlighted in green the transition metals. Those are the group B elements. Notice those are labeled column 3B across with B's. So the B group is the transition metal group. They are in green. We also have at the bottom across in purple the lanthanides and across in orange the actinides. So transition metals in green and at the bottom lanthanides and actinides. So this slide is just showing you the inner transition metals or the two rows at the bottom of the periodic table. Again, they're called lanthanides and actinides. Uh, one interesting thing about the actinides is they're all radioactive. In fact, everything above 93 are man-made and particle accelerators. So back to the periodic table, everything above NP, number 93, everything above that is man-made in a particle accelerator. 
and most of those are radioactive, you can see, by the parentheses around the atomic mass number. So we can ask you some questions. I'll have you pause your video right here and answer these three questions for me. Go ahead and hit pause. All right, we're back. Let's see if you answered these three questions correctly. The alkali metal in the third period. So remember to count down three starting with hydrogen and helium, the first level, down one, two, three, and then look for the first column, which is the alkali metals, and if you said sodium, Na, you are correct. The next question is the halogen in the second period. So again, hydrogen and helium are the first period, then we have the next row is the second period, and we want the halogen. So the halogen is column 7A, so where that column intersects with the second period, we have fluorine. Hope you got that right. And then finally, the noble gas in the fourth period is so starting with hydrogen and helium, that's period one, count down one, two, three, four. Noble gas is the last column, column 8A. The noble gas there is, you're right if you said KR, KR for krypton. Good job. Here's just a reminder of the metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. In pink, we have our nonmetals. The nonmetals are largely on the right side of the table, except for hydrogen, which is way over left. Uh, but hydrogen is, in fact, a non-metal, even though it's on the metal side. So everything in pink is a non-metal. Now on the left side of the stair-step line, we have our blue elements. Those are the metals. If it's in blue, it is a metal. The majority of the elements are, in fact, in blue metals. And then the yellow along the stair steppy line is the metal -loids. Remember the exception there is aluminum. Aluminum is exception. It is not in yellow. It is a metal. But everything else touching the stair steppy line is a metalloid in yellow. Now we're going to talk about a trend, atomic size. The atomic size is measuring how large the atom is. It also relates to the radius, which is the distance from the nucleus of an atom out to its outer electron. So the radius is half of the diameter, so that's related to the atom size as well. So look at a periodic table. As we're going down, do you think we're getting bigger or smaller? So this one's kind of obvious. Yeah, as we're going down, we are getting bigger. That's because we're jumping out from one energy level to the second energy level to the third energy level to the fourth energy level and getting bigger and bigger as we go down a group or column. So we have more energy levels, so we have a bigger radius, so we have a bigger atom. Now, why don't you look sideways? Do you think we're getting bigger as we move to the left or to the right as we go side to side in the periodic table? Chances you are, you said, it increases to the right. That's probably what your gut instinct told you. That's because the numbers are getting bigger that way. But in fact, we're actually getting bigger towards the left of a periodic table, of a row. So that sounds crazy, right? Because the numbers are getting smaller. So how can we actually be getting bigger as we go to the left? Well, what happens as we go across a row, as we go across towards the right, the number increasing is the number of what? The atomic number. Protons. Protons are in the nucleus. So we're adding a proton in the nucleus. That doesn't make the atom get any bigger and we're adding an electron to the same energy level. Well, that energy level is not getting bigger. So if anything, it's staying the same size. Uh, but you have to remember, as we're putting protons in the middle, the positive charge is increasing. And what do positives and negatives do? If you said attract, you're right. Opposites attract. So as we're putting more protons in the middle, it's attracting those electrons closer. So actually, as we go across a row, we're getting smaller because those protons are pulling in more. So as the slide says, as we go across to the right, the number of protons increase, so it's more positive. As the positive charge increases, the electrons are pulled closer, so the atom is actually smaller. So we are getting bigger as we move to the left. The trend's like a snowman that fell down. So if you look, we're getting bigger as we go down, and we're getting bigger as we move towards the left.
So it's like a snowman that fell down. The trend increases down and to the left. Down and to the left. Here's a picture of some relative atomic sizes. As you can see, we are definitely getting bigger as we go down, and we're definitely getting bigger as we move to the left. So we can ask questions like this. Go ahead and pause your video and answer these questions for me. Go ahead and pause. Okay, so for the first question, which is bigger, O, S, E, or T, E? O, S, E, or T, E? These are all in the same column. So it is the one that is most down at the bottom, T, E. That's because it has more energy levels, so it's a larger radius. It's the most down, definitely bigger. What about B, M, G, S, I, or S? Now those are all on the same row. Hopefully remembered, it's bigger towards the left, so M, G. That's because silicon and sulfur have more protons and they're pulling those electrons in closer. So again, when we're on the same row, as we increase our atomic number of protons, we actually pull in a little bit closer. So we get a little bit smaller as we go across. So M, G is the biggest. There's a YouTube video on the Chem 130 website on atomic size for more detail. Please watch that. Uh, it's a very good video. It gives you more detail on understanding atomic size because you should be prepared to answer questions like why. Why is this bigger? All right. Next up is ionization energy, which is the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom. So it's the energy to go up to an electron, grab it, and pull it away from that atom. So that does take some energy. You can't just pull an electron away uh, without spending some sort of energy. The equation for ionization energy, as an example with sodium, is we have a sodium gas atom, and it becomes sodium plus one, plus the electron that we removed. So ionization energy increases as we go up a column or a group. That's because it's really hard to move, remove electrons from a tiny atom. The electron is very close to the proton. So that electron is close to the proton, opposites attract. It's very hard to remove that electron from a small atom because the electron is so close to the nucleus. Now for a big old atom, you have a nucleus and then the electron's way out here. So it's far away, so there's not very much attraction. So it's a lot easier to remove that electron from that big atom. So it's ionization energy. It takes more energy as we go up a group. Ionization energy increases from left to the right. This is largely because metals have a low ionization energy. This is because they want to lose electrons anyway. So removing an electron from them is all right. Uh, it just takes a little bit of energy because they actually want to lose that electron because it makes them like a noble gas. Nonmetals, however, on this side have a very high ionization energy. They want to gain electrons, not lose them. So losing them is going in the opposite direction for them. It's very bad. They're very unhappy about this. So it takes a lot of energy to remove from a nonmetal. They're holding on to their electrons very tightly. So it takes a lot of energy to remove from a nonmetal. Here's a chart just showing you that as we go from left to right, we do in fact increase in ionization energy. You can see the peaks on this graph are the noble gases. The noble gases are the farthest to the right, and they have the highest ionization energies. The lowest peaks would be our alkali metals. They have the lowest ionization energies because they want to lose an electron anyway. So again, ionization energy increases as we go from the metals towards the nonmetals. Nonmetals have the high ionization energy. So we can ask questions like this, which has a larger ionization energy and why? Go ahead and pause your video. All right, we're back. So which has the larger ionization energy, Cl, Al, or Mg? Hopefully you said Cl. That's because it's a nonmetal and it wants to gain electrons, not lose them. So it has the higher ionization energy. Cl is going to hold on to its electrons really tight. 
does not want to lose them. Whereas aluminum and magnesium are metals, they want to give away their electrons, so they're not holding on as tight. Less energy for them. What about B? Lithium, rubidium, and potassium. They're all in the same column. Go ahead and pause your video. And we're back. Hopefully you said lithium. It has the highest ionization energy because it's the smallest atom, so it has its electrons very close to the nucleus, so it's very hard to pull them away. So lithium is the smallest, and it holds its electrons tighter than larger atoms, such as potassium and rubidium. There is a YouTube video on ionization energy on the Chem 130 website. It has more detail. Um, it is a very good video. I highly recommend you watching that video after you're finished this with, with this one. Finally, our last topic is electronegativity, often abbreviated EN. This is the ability of an atom to attract bonded electrons. Okay, so let's think about that. The ability of an atom to attract bonded electrons means pulling them in close to themselves, kind of like a magnet. Now fluorine is the most electronegative atom. No one pulls electrons tighter than fluorine. Fluorine takes those bonded electrons and holds onto them really, really tight. So the further away we are from fluorine, the less electronegative we are. Another way to state that is the closer we are to fluorine, the more electronegative we are. And you can see from our picture there that electronegativity increases to the right and up in the periodic table. And again, pointing up towards fluorine, fluorine has the highest ionization energy. So again, electronegativity is the ability of an atom to pull bonded electrons close. Now, the noble gases don't even have electronegativity values. Why do you think that is? Okay, helium's not the most electronegative, it's fluorine. Fluorine is the most up and to the right for electronegativity. Why, why isn't it helium then? Why are the noble glasses excluded? Well, it's because the key is bonded electrons. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to pull bonded electrons close. And noble gases don't have bonds, so they don't have bonded electrons, so they can't pull them close. So the most electronegative element, again, is fluorine. All right, that's the end of chapter six. Watch this video a couple of times. Make sure you got the chapter. Look at your text. Look at your end of chapter problems. Look at the other two videos on atomic size and ionization energy and do the worksheets. Thank you very much.